we wanted to start with the general concept of today is that we're dealing with hi hi nancy david well oh, andrew hi everybody hi and hi. if anybody wants also besides if anybody could interject at any time with another option anybody can write in on the side panel any comments or questions and we wanted to talk about the topic today of chesed chesed is the topic of generally assumed we would assume chesed is to expand ourselves into doing for other people and this is actually very relevant in today the concept of chesed because we find that in the time of a pestilence of a plague or something else we find that chesed has an extreme relevance to be able to, to be able to take away that challenge that pestilence that plague that's facing us and we find a story that this story happened in the in the talmudic times that <clears throat> there was a pestilence that was going on in a certain city and many people were dying many people were 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 becoming sick and and it was really it seemed like it was something that was contagious catching and they didn't have the medical abilities that we have today indefinitely and as this is happening, there was a great sage that lived in that place. And that sage, he was praying day and night in order for it to be able to alleviate the situation that was there then. And all of a sudden, in the middle while everything was happening, the plague came to a complete end. And everybody thought, of course, you know, because we have this amazing sage and he's been praying. And of course, the plague came to a complete end. And he had a dream that night, this great sage. And the dream said, you should know that it's not because of you that the, that the, the, the plague alleviated. The reason is, is because there was somebody in the town that when nobody wanted to bury the dead because they were afraid of catching the plague, that person, a simple person, went and he buried them. And it's because of him that the plague stopped. And to really understand this, on a, on, a, on, a, on a level how this works. So we find that the Talmud in Brachot tells us that a person that's in times of, in times of peace, it's not so easy for the, for, for the angel of, of death or something to get the person. There's a lot of bureaucracy. You can't just go ahead and say, you know, we want to take this person. There's a ton of bureaucracy. And it says that there are six steps he has to take in order to get to a person. No. However, in a time of a plague, he only needs to take one step. All that bureaucracy and the red tape is cut out. But there's one other angel that also has the ability to go on one step, and it actually could be on the same level as the angel of death even in that time. And that is the angel of Michael. And Michael is the angel that represents chesed. He represents kindness, doing for others. And being that Michal represents this kindness, doing for others, and that's what, he, that's what Michal represents, he's the one, and kindness and chesed is the one that's able to go against the, the, the danger that there is in the time of a plague. Mm -hmm. And the question is, so how do we get Michal to be in our team? And the answer is, is that however a person acts themselves, so that's how... The, that's how in heaven it gets acted towards him. So if a person is involved with chesed and kindness and helping others, so, so too in the same realm, that, that angel of chesed, which is Michal, could help a person and, and he's be sent down to help a person to be able to protect him in the times of danger. So the question is really, what is chesed? Do we understand, is chesed the way we simply understand what chesed is? What is essentially chesed? What is chesed? Also, how do we become, how do we make, become more, more, how do we make that we become a, more of a Bali chesed, more of people that are doing chesed? What is it that essentially encourages ourselves to be able to be people of, of kindness of chesed? Revolba, Revolba was a, was a, was a great 
he was a great thinker and a great sage, that he lived in Israel towards the end of his life. Originally before that, Revolba lived, he came originally from Germany, and he was studying in a university in, in Paris in France when he met Rabbi Rucham Levavitz. Rabbi Rucham Levavitz was one of the great leaders of the, of the Musser movement, of the self, using the Torah to work on oneself. And he got very connected to Rabbi Rucham Levavitz. And he stayed, he ended up joining the Mir Yeshiva and he learned by him a long time. And later on in his life, he started giving his own classes in, originally he started an institution in Israel, then he was basically just leading these classes on self-work. And Revolba has a chapter on chesed, on kindness. And Revolba starts off, he says, what is chesed? He said, chesed isn't that when we're sitting in the, or, you know, we're sitting in the corner of the supermarket and somebody comes over and you see, we see from the corner of her eye that they're, you know, collecting money. And as we're walking through the aisle, you know, we kind of just happen to bump into the person. He puts out his hand and we give them the dollar. And the person walks away, says, Revolba, that's essentially derech eretz. More than the fact that it's chesed, it's actually doing kindness. In the most reality, it's actually derech eretz because the normal and the, and, the, and the humane thing to do is that if somebody puts out their hand right in front of a person, they give them a dollar. That doesn't necessarily reflect on the fact of a person being a Baal Chesed, a person being somebody who's, who's a kind person, who does kindness for somebody else. It's like, okay, we got cornered in the supermarket. You know, there's no way to get out of this. Or in a certain circumstance where we know we see somebody that's walking down the street and they're, and they're, and they're, they're stumbling under their packages. It's the main thing to do in order to help that person. But what does it mean to actually be a Baal Chesed? Somebody who's a person of kindness, that kindness defines them. Sir Volba turns to a, a passage in the Talmud that essentially explains the verse, what does it mean to be a, to be a Baal Ches? What does it mean to be a person of kindness? And Revolba, he says, the verse says, <clears throat> this is the verse that essentially talks about kindness and chesed. Ki tiftach that we open our hand the habit tabit and we reach out and we pass him de machsaray ashayasale, whatever is missing to him. Now, what does it mean that we hand a person whatever is missing to them? States Rashi, the habit tabitena. We look in and we kind of look into the person to really understand what they need. Imla Yirtz Matana, not everybody, even if they sometimes need it, not everybody wants a present. Then we'll give it to him as a loan. And then it says, Asher Yechsele, whatever he's missing, Afilus Sus Lirchalov, even if he's a person that's used to a Rolls Royce, he's used to a, 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 he's used to a chauffeur to drive him around. And then all of a sudden, times come like times that we're in right now where businesses are, are, many of them are closed. A lot of the real estate agent came to a standstill and many agents don't have, and many people in all areas, their work is not functioning the way that it usually is, or many of them that came to a standstill. Many people are, are, are un unfortunately not continuing in the companies they're working for simply because the companies don't have the ability, they don't have the, the continuation to be able to pay them. And if you have a person that's used to a very high standard, and then circumstances cause that they don't have the ability anymore to be able to continue that standard. So the mitzvah is, is that we should help them out continue on their standard. And now obviously there are, there are different, we know that there's many, many places that do need help. So obviously it's not just a matter of right away going and, 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 and giving the money to buy the new Rolls Royce. However, if we actually had the ability there's a concept to actually help the person. Normally we can look at that, we can say, what does that mean? I mean, I don't go around in such a car. I'm going around driving a Toyota and I should actually make a difference and I should try to help the other person live up to the high standards. What does that mean? Why, why do we have to do such a thing? Sir Volva says, he says, because chesed, chesed, more than it's about 
the kindness that we ourselves are doing, it's about understanding what does that other person need. And therefore, says Rashi, Imla Yirza, if he doesn't want it in a present, give it to him behalva. Give it to him as a loan. Because many times this is a much bigger present and it's a it's a much bigger chesed. Give it to the person in the way that they're comfortable. There's a story about Rabbi Yosef Chaim Zanenfeld. Rabbi Yosef Chaim Zanenfeld was a great sage who lived in Jerusalem in the, in the early 1900s. And there was a time, probably similar to now, that travel now came to a standstill. People are stuck in a lot of areas. But however, in that time, the early 1900s, there was a wealthy person that got stuck in Jerusalem. And Rabbi Yosef Chaim Zanenfeld, and he was there actually for Pesach, for Passover. And Rabbi Yosef Chaim Zanenfeld, he invited him over to his house for Passover. And the man said to Rabbi Yosef Chaim Zanenfeld, he says, he says, it's okay, I could pay, I could pay my own well, way in. How much is it going to cost to have me over for Passover? And, and I'll be happy to join you. So Rabbi Yosef Chaim Zanefeld, being that he understood this concept, that chesed is not about us, and it's not about the fact that I'm giving and like I'm, I'm I can actually, look, I could give him a, a, a Pesach meal, and I could give him a, I can invite him to my house, and I could do hachnas asarachim. Rabbi Yosef Chaim Zanesel said, yeah, this person is going to feel extremely uncomfortable not being able to pay his way in. So therefore, Rabbi Yosef Chaim Zanenfeld named quite a high sum as expenses that would be incurred by the person coming over to his house for the, for the meal. And this person came over to Rabbi Yosef Chaim Zanefeld, and he came over to the Savior, and he ate his shear of the matzah, and he ate his shear of, the, of, the, of all the food that they served, and he really lived it up. When he wanted a good wine, he had no problem opening up the bottle because he paid his way into it. He paid well for it. He, had, he made sure that he, you know, whatever he wanted in the meats, he ate it. And he was extremely comfortable the entire Passover. There's a difference in Israel and the rest of the world in the realm that in Israel, if a person is in Pesach, there's only one day of Yom Tov for the first days of Yom Tov and the last days of Yom Tov because essentially we only have one Pesach night, we have one Passover day, and then the rest of it becomes Cholamod, which we're allowed to do, we're allowed to work, and the last day of Passover is also like that. In, in Chutz Laaretz, outside of, of the land of Israel, being that there was a complication back in the days that the way the months worked was according to the, to, the, to, the, to the large court that was in Jerusalem, that essentially established when the month will be starting. Sometimes we added in an extra month before Nisan, we added in a second Adar, and therefore it ended up, it ended up sometimes pushing off the month and making it earlier. <clears throat> also, when they saw the new moon, that's the day the month started. So therefore, in Israel, there's no reason there should be a really more than one day of Yom Tov for the first day or on the, on the last day, because the, the Bible only says to have one day. However, in the, rest of the, in the rest of the world, being that many times they were not able to get messengers and missionaries to be able to tell them that, by the way, the... The, we, we, the moon was blessed on this day, or the moon was blessed on, th on that on second day, and therefore the great courts instituted either the first day or the second day as Rosh Chodesh. They won't be able to tell them in time, so therefore they had two days, which we continue today, because being that it was, it was, it was instituted, we have two days of Yom Tov. So this person that was in Israel, being that he, he came and he lived from outside of Israel, so if a person just goes there for, for, for a holiday, he keeps the way that he always kept in, in a place he originates from. So that person had two days, uh, two days of holiday in the last days, and this, this, this second day, he was not by Rabbi Zonnefeld, being there for Rabbi Zonnefeld, it was not Passover anymore. Rabbi Zonnefeld walks into his house, and he puts the whole wad of money down on the table, and he starts leaving. And the man looks at him, he says, why are you giving my money back? I was just buying it for the whole Passover. So everybody's unfulfilled. You think I'm going to take, your, take the money 
from having you over for Passover. We love that you came over for Passover. You did a bigger favor for us by being our guests than we did for you by the fact you were able to come to us. So the man said, Sarah, why do you take my money in the first place? So Rezanifel looked at him and he said, because if I didn't take the money, then you would not have been comfortable coming and eating the entire, the entire meal. And even if you would have, you would have felt uncomfortable. You would have taken the beer minimum. You would not have made yourself comfortable to be able to drink the wine, which I wanted you to. So therefore, the only way that to be able to make the situation that you'd be comfortable, which would really what I wanted to, was by letting you pay for it. But now, there's no necessity for this. It was a bigger favor for us. So here's the money back and he left it on the table. And that's the idea we're talking about now, that chesed is not about us getting into idea that, oh, I want to do chesed, and then figuring out, okay, so I want to do chesed. So I think the best idea is to do, quote, unquote. The idea of chesed is to see what the other person needs. To be able to look around and to understand other people. And that's the first step of chesed. The first step of chesed doesn't start with us. It doesn't start with saying that I want to be a person that's involved with chesed. I want to be a person that's involved with kindness. And therefore, let me write up a list with all the things that I'm going to do. And look at, I'm going to look at my list you know, every, every Sunday morning and say, okay, this is on my le- list for the chesed that I want to do. And, you know, let me see, if, can I do this? Can, you know, let me see if I could find somebody apropos to this thing, to this thing. That's not, chesed is about, says Revolva. And that's what he says it means in Yirtza Bahava, however he's comfortable. It's about looking at other people and understanding other people. And therefore, Revolva says, he says, do you know what the first step to chesed is? And this is essentially how Revolva understands what, what Adam acquired from the, from the Etz Hadas, from the tree, of, the tree of knowledge, and he goes in to explain this? Imagination. Revolva says that this power that we naturally have in many children, we see them as a child, that children take Lego blocks and then they build the Lego blocks higher and higher, they make out of it castles, things out of the fairy tales. And they take, they could take, you give them a little water and who knows what kind of, of, of they can make a ditch around there. They could put a castle in the middle. And, and it's, it's crazy what children are able to, and amazing what children are able to do with some, some raw materials. With some raw materials we just gave our, our, our kids the other day. Some paper and tape and they ended up making these Seder plates and all these, all these things out of simple paper. And what is that imagination? What is the idea of imagination? Imagination is such a strong essence. It's such a natural part of what every child, when he's young, every child, their world starts with imagination. And why is this such a focal point? Why is this such a, such a natural point in, in children, the imagination? So a lot of it is because in order to be able to succeed, in order to be able to think of new ideas, to be able to put new into the world is essentially through imagination. However, Evolva says, he says, chesed is one of the most basic, one of the most important parts of being similar to God. When we want to be similar to him, the, the, the Talmud tells us in the Tractate of Sota, that what does it mean to be similar to God? How can we be similar to God? He's a burning fire. He's not physical. He's something that's, that's an entirely different realm. Says the Talmud that we go after God in the realm of chesed. And just like God is, is, is constantly doing chesed, bringing down rain, bringing up, the, bringing up from the earth, the, the dew in order to make all the trees and all the gorgeous, beautiful fruits that are delicious and red when we want to, when, when, when the parts that we bite into, the rind of the, the watermelon is green, so we shouldn't bite. And there's so much chesed that's constantly going into the world. And it says about God, we say this in Ashray, and we say the, 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 the prayer of praiseworthy, 
one of the most greatest praises that we give is that he opens his, his hands, umazvia, and he satisfies lechol chai for every little being. Ratzain. Ratzain means not what he wants to give them, their needs. Because God is, 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 is in essence looking at each one of us and saying, what do we need? It's not about what God wants to do for us. He gives us what we feel that we need. Our needs, because he's looking and he's evaluating, he's understanding. What is it that, what is it that this person needs? What is it that that other person needs? Because what chesed is essentially about is about fulfilling that person's needs. And therefore, that's really how to explain the end of what Rashi talks about. The end of what Rashi talks about in that, in, that, in that verse was that if somebody normally has a horse to ride on, if somebody normally has, has he drives these, these fancy, these nice cars. So when this person, his, his ability to be able to, he loses his job or he loses his business. Chesed essentially says that yes, we want to be able to replace that. Because chesed isn't really our understanding of what should we be giving, what does a person need. Chesed is simply looking at the other uh, people around us and saying, this person, understanding, using our imagination, this imagination that we grew up with as children, we manifest this imagination at this point. What do we use with our imagination? We didn't get back to that part. But what do we do with our imagination? Our imagination is essentially to be similar to God. And just like he sees, and he looks into, and he says, what is it essentially? What is essentially that every little living being needs? And the same way that he does that, we also do. That we use our imagination to go around at people that we see randomly, we're going around in the, in the supermarket. And part of chesed is seeing what does that person need? And, there, and we'll end up seeing that sometimes if we have an in, in mind a certain, a certain area that like, you know, when I go to the supermarket, I want to be a bal chesed and therefore I'm going to help in this way. And sometimes we can go there and we start seeing that, you know, this person is kind of looking towards the upper shelf. Well, it seems like on the upper shelf is sitting this, um, this hand wash everybody needs. And chances are that, that, that that's what they're looking for because, you know, assuming that this is the situation that they're shopping for. So let me go ask, let me go help them get that down. Because it's not about pre-planning what chesed is. It's rather looking around at every single person and understanding. And sometimes in order to do that, it means we really have to use our imagination. A number of years ago, I was on the bus in Staten Island and it was going from, it was actually going from the Staten Island Mall towards the yeshiva that I was in. I had to go pick something up. And sitting next to me is a man, he was probably, at that point, he's probably in his, in his 50s. He had, he had a certain look he had, he had long hair, full of tattoos, a hardened, a hardened look, but a softness at the same time, a bit, a bit of confusion. And he had this kind of ring on his hand. And I looked at, I looked at him, he was sitting next to me. I said, this guy for sure fought in Vietnam. And I was interested. I read, I read, I read, I was younger then. I read a couple of books about, about the Vietnam War. And I turned to him and I said, did you fight in Nam? And he looks at me with this look of like, you know, a bit like on edge. And he says, yes. So at that point, I really didn't pre-plan the next part of the conversation. But I thought to myself, I said, he's obviously not interested in just discussing the Vietnam War, especially since he probably figures the reason I'm asking is that many veterans, after they got back from the war, after they had been in the, in, in, in the trenches, literally, every single night 
not knowing if they're going to be attacked from the rear, from the front, from every single area. After going through the jungles, the wilderness, seeing their friends shot in front of their eyes from behind the bushes, and when they turned, there were bullets coming towards them also. They came back to the U.S., and everybody was like, why in the world did you fight that war? What were you doing? So I just looked at him and I said, it must have been really hard for you seeing all your friends, the insecurity and seeing so many of them that you became close to being shot without even having a chance. And he looked at me and for the rest of the bus ride, he was telling me story after story about many of his close friends and about things that I wouldn't be surprised if he never talked about because because nobody ever asked him that because the way that he was he was talking about he was just going on and on and it was really even hard for me when I had to get off the bus I had a hard time finding an intersection in order to be able to to kind of mention you know that that, that I was you know, leaving on the bus and etc and we're you know to, to continue a few words of but a lot of it is because if I would have just walked onto the onto the bus and I would have looked about what does this person need without actually looking into and thinking about what did this person go through. <clears throat> I would have said, okay, um, maybe he wants more room next to his seat. You know, maybe the biggest favor I could do to him is actually get up and I could walk somewhere else because, you know, make him a little more comfortable if people have room next to their seat. But when we look at a person and we start trying to get out of our own minds, out of our own world, and rather enter the realm of imagination, and we're looking at the person, and now we don't live it, we, our reality changes. The reality of the world we're looking in doesn't become the reality of my reality. Everything just shifts. And all of a sudden, the haze kind of overtakes us, and our world entirely shifts over to the world of another person. Our world all of a sudden shifts over to the world of behind in the jungles of Vietnam. A world shifted <clears throat> to the, uh, the world of coming back as a veteran, as living for years afterwards with that situation. That's really what chesed is, says Revolta. And that's what it means <clears throat> to go into the other person, to understand other people. And that's essentially, if we want to become people of chesed, we want to become similar to God. It's peseach esyedecha to open up of our hands. However, there's a step before that. To give every person their needs because we understand their needs. And the first step really is when we're walking around <clears throat> to try to look at many, many different people. People that are even close to us. Sometimes we have people that we live with all the time and we're still in this realm of this is really what they want we're still in this realm that whatever we want is essentially becomes looked at by the other person in the same way. The chances are they want the same thing. But the first step is to try to enter their mind, their world, their side of things, and to try to see what they really want. And says Revolva in his next, in his next VOD, Revolva says the truth is, is that this is not going to be that simple, even though it sounds like it. Because usually what's going to end up happening is, is we're going to see ourselves in their world. Because being that we live in our own lives and we, leave, we, leave, we live with ourself, we live with our understanding, most of the time, the anoichias, the I, gets a big place in even our outlook of the world. Our feelings, our experiences always become pushed onto the other person. There was a story of the Chayzam of Lublin that the Chayzam of Lublin, he was the, called the seer of Lublin. He was one of the great Hasidic masters that lived in Europe. And the Chayzam of Lublin was in his house once and a student of his knocked on the door. And the Chose said, who is it? He said, I, assuming that the Chose obviously knows his voice and he's going to let him in. And the Chose said, who is it? And he said, I. Until finally he changed his answer. 
And the Chayzim of Lublin let him in. And he said to the Chayzim of Lublin, you didn't recognize my voice this time. And the Chayzim said, no. But the essential part of answering who we are is not always the I. It's not always the focus on, on, who, of, 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 on my own world and myself. And therefore, when it comes to chesed, it's essentially stepping out of the I. We're separately, we're, we, we have to take our imagination and I have to say to myself, it's not about the I and it's not about my world. I'm entirely leaving that, that essence. I'm entirely leaving that to try to understand that other person's needs. And the first step is leaving the I. When I used to go to Israel back and forth, I used to make a stop in Budapest. And the reason I stopped in Budapest the first time was essentially because the flights that were at that point were really cheap going through Budapest. And the first time I went to Yeshiva in Israel, and my parents said, it's okay, we'll pay for a direct flight. And I said, I said, I said, you know what? Don't we have a great uncle? Or I had a great uncle that was living in Budapest. I didn't really know him because I hadn't really met him. He actually came into the US once for my bar mitzvah. And that was about the only connection that the families had with him in Budapest. I said, hey, why don't I go there? It's a 12 hour stopover and I'll stop in Budapest and I'll go visit him. That kind of became the tradition that every time I was going afterwards back and forth to, to Israel, which happened a lot of times, I used to stop in Budapest for, for 12 hour stopovers. This great uncle, Uncle Leo, he used to come pick me up at the airport. We used to go back to his, he used to go back to his, his, his apartment. And he would show me around different places in Budapest and we would talk, he would show pictures. When I used to go back and forth, so my grandmother, was, which was his sister, she used to always send shirts, different hats that he liked. And I mean, I thought that just the same reason I figured that like, you know, if I was living in that area, so I, I would appreciate also, you know, these Amer the shirts coming from America and different, different of these clothes. And I figured that was probably the, you know, the biggest present, the century that I was giving him was the fact that, you know, I was bringing him these things from America. And I figured from his side, from my side of thing, it was pretty interesting, you know, seeing around Budapest. He was showing me around all the different streets, different stories that happened. He was essentially there from, he stayed there from after World War II. He once told me that there was a uh, 100,000 Jews that essentially stayed over in Budapest directly after the war. Most of them ended up leaving. He had a very good position over there and he stayed there throughout his years. And I figured, okay, you know, the, probably the biggest favor that I'm doing uh, from his side of things is bringing him this stuff. Until one time, I really understood that that wasn't the chesed that I was doing by going to him. That was definitely a nice gesture, and he definitely appreciated it, but that wasn't really the main thing. And if I would have known that earlier, then I probably would have had a different connection relationship the entire time, and my focus being there would have been very different. It was one of the last times that I had gone to visit him in Budapest. It might have actually been the last time after that, I think I might have gotten married and then we ended up flying direct. He didn't know that it would have been the last time essentially, but we were standing on the lawn <clears throat> outside of his building in Budapest. And he had called an airport service to, to pick me up and bring me back to the airport that time. And we were sitting on the lawn. He was talking about how since the war, he hasn't really been in, in contact with any relatives. He had one son that had, being that it was communist, they moved away from, from they moved away, moved away from, from the country, they moved away from Hungary. He sent him out and his son did not have much, much contact with him. He left when he was 17 years old and he got used to that kind of reality being that there wasn't much of a connection. They couldn't have a connection because the whole way that they had to play it was the fact that his son ran away because he didn't want to have a connection. And that's the only reason why he wasn't, he wasn't jailed for throwing, for, 
helping his son escape. And we were sitting on the grass and he was talking about the different relatives that were there in Europe. And he, we were going through the different names of the people that, that are around today and what they're doing. And he started telling me about <clears throat> songs that they used to sing before the war. And he started singing my Shtetla Bells. And as he was singing my Shtetla Bells, just so much emotion. And then he started talking about the, the he started talking about the, the, you know, the home before the war and et cetera. And I noticed that the main thing that I was doing by going to visit him wasn't the shirts. It wasn't the hats. It was the fact that after so many years, he had someone to share his feelings of a different realm, a relative, not from his world that existed after the war, but the memories, the strong memories that existed during that time, the time before that, the times of his home, years, and all his, all his siblings, all his relatives were either killed in the war or they went to the U.S., which he didn't have much of a connection to. I mean, my grandmother used to speak to him actually once, once, once a week, but it was very limited. And the biggest chesed was essentially the fact that he had someone to cheer, to cheer his experiences, to cheer his, to cheer his world that existed before then. And that was the main thing that he needed. <clears throat> and the truth is, is that if I would have really sat down the first time that I saw him, and I would have said to him, I would have thought to him, first of all, this is not about me visiting Budapest, this is really about him, which is more important to. This is not about what I would appreciate over such a visit. What does it mean? What, is, what does he need? He was a very, he, <clears throat> he was a very classy, put together person. He had a very high position, but essentially there was something that he needed much more than that. And that recognition, that being able to tell what other pers- people need is the essentially the first step to what chesed is about. <clears throat> and Revolva continues in his third vod, and he says there are certain people, there are certain things that definitely we could take on as a general assumption that everybody needs that. For instance, everybody could use a simple smile, a simple welcome. That's something that whenever we, lo- we look at another person, and that doesn't take a knowledge that the other person needs it, but sometimes it's just, it just a matter of, of really getting out of ourselves, not in the sense of what a person needs. Sometimes we can use things that we would feel on other people, but simply to notice the state that they're in. Rav Shlomo Freifeld talked about that. He went to Israel one of the times, and he was standing. He had an institution, Shari Yashiv, in New York, and when he was standing once, and he was inside in, in Israel, and he came to praise, and he was feeling very overwhelmed. He didn't know anybody over there. And somebody came over to him, and he said, he gave, put out his hand, he said, welcome. You know, welcome, welcome to Israel. What's your name? And he said, his, the whole world changed. The whole world changed because now he became, he became part of things. So there are certain things that are, that are much easier to work in the realm of chesed, things that we normally need. And it's just the situation now is not for us, but the other person would need it. And then there are certain things <clears throat> that it's a matter of entirely <clears throat> using our imagination, this ability of imagination to step out of ourselves to see what the other person might need. And this actually, especially in times like this, could help us immensely. Because there are studies that are done that when a person leaves their own, their own needs and helps take care of somebody else's needs, focuses on somebody else's needs, then it actually could do two things. In a normal time, it can actually alleviate, it can make a person happier. And these are studies that were done, it's a Harvard study. And the Harvard study, they gave a group of people, they gave them, I think it was $50. And 50 of them, they told, to, to use it on to buy something in the mall, and 50 of them they said to find somebody who needs it. Afterwards, they went back to rate their level of satisfaction. All those who gave it to somebody else, 
their level of satisfaction after the story was much higher. So I don't know if they would have said it before, before they actually spent the money that they're happy about their mission. But after it was done, the ones that spent it on helping somebody else, as opposed to the ones who spent it in a restaurant, who probably afterwards felt like, oh my, if only I would have just skipped that restaurant and I would have felt much better. I would have saved me a day in the gym and a lot of other things. But essentially, the ones that used it to give to somebody else were immensely more happier about that situation. And not only that, but if a person takes their mind and focuses on other people, then all of a sudden there are challenges. And right now, it's a very challenging time that many of us are, are not in the red, or all of us essentially are affected. And not in the regular way of things are working. The, the, the schools have either closed or transferred online, so either for children, about the businesses, about the, the social area, which are all essentially very much a part of us and part of our necessities. But the more that we could step over into somebody else's, to somebody else's world, to somebody else's realm, it could also alleviate our, it also alleviates our troubles and our pains because we're not focused on them anymore. And essentially, they might not even to a certain degree be there anymore. There was a number of years ago that I was in Meiron. Meiron is in Alag Ba'emer, Bar Shem Ba'yachai. There was a, there used to, there, there was a great, of standing around the, the, the fire burning the, of, of the cotton wool, the blaze coming out and thousands of people are dancing. And that year, circumstances were that it ended up being taken afterwards, but I was basically slipping in and out of consciousness. And this was a medical condition that had come up at that point. And I'd gone af- out to the, to the hospital afterwards and it was, it, was, it, was, it was taken care of. But at that point, it was a certain medical condition that the first time it had come up. And I was basically like, there was no way that I could even travel back to Jerusalem. And I sat down on a, on, a, on, a, on a log on the top of the mountain. And I felt like I had to hold on to be able to, to, to stay conscious. And somebody sits down next to me, an old Sephardic Jew. And he just starts talking about his children and all the mistakes that he made in his life with raising them and where they're now, what he could have done differently. And I had no track of time then. But all I do know is that I didn't have to concentrate on myself and everything was just my mind slipped entirely off of myself into thinking about this, this person being that it was just so dramatic, the stories and what he was saying over. And all of a sudden, everything became, by the time that he finished talking, it was fine and I was able to get back to Jerusalem with no, no problem. Because when we focus on taking all our minds off of ourselves and do the first step of chesed, the first step of helping other people, which is essentially to understand to take our mind off of ourselves, to look at what does the other person need, to and we go like a Yisuf Chaim Zonenfeld, and we sit there and we say, there's somebody inviting over to my meal, but is it really the main idea, just that chesed, the fact that I'm inviting him over? Or is the inviting him over to my meal another aspect? Maybe there's something that you feel uncomfortable about it that I could do in order to make him feel more comfortable. It's entering into that person's realm. So this is really the first step towards chesed. And once we have there, the question is, okay, so how do we take it after the first step and become people, how do we create in ourselves to become people that are more focused on chesed, to become people that are essentially, how do we make ourselves to be, to, 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 to think more about other people and this area will Bezrat Hashem discuss more next time, the by the next Tuesday morning, which essentially is how do we become, how do we how do we create that in ourselves? And essentially, we'll talk more about the idea of a haftal recha What is that? What does that mean to love another person like ourselves? How do we expand ourselves in our in our own world? And what is it that would fuel us, that would make us become more people of chesed and caring about others? And that, Be'ezrat Hashem, will 
we'll go into more in the next time.